for today, we just begin. We're going to be a little bit of a journey of a message today in our first section. Just want to think about your dad as we begin today. Um, who was your dad? What was your dad like? Let's think about our dads. Uh, there's a, a man in Australia named Steve Bidoff. We've got a, a picture of Steve coming up now. Steve uh, is an Australian author, activist, psychologist. He was actually uh, Australian Father of the Year back in 2001. And he's written lots of good books on raising boys and daughters. And uh, his best-selling book is called Manhood. I read this when I was about 40. Really good book for all men. In fact, I'd say all women to read. And so Steve is a, a well-respected um, person in the area of families, and particularly fathers. And uh, in this book, Steve talks about, he does lots of men's events. And uh, he says, uh, over the decades, if I've got 100 men in the room, and I ask them, what was your relationship like with your dad? He says, 30 men who will lift their hand up and said they had no relationship with their father. 30 men out of the 100 will basically say, I barely talk to my dad. Uh, I rarely make time to see him. And when I do, I don't really enjoy it. They're basically estranged from their father. And there's a lot of anger and hurt when those 30 men think about their dad. That's it's pretty shocking, isn't it? 30% of men uh, have no relationship with their dad. Uh, another 30 will say they have a difficult relationship with their dad, even hostile. Um, they might see their dad at birthdays, holidays, family gatherings, uh, but there's always something wrong. <laughs> there's a mutual exchange of disagreements, even if it's over which brand of lawnmower is the best. Um, there's a connection, but it's prickly. <laughs> There's not much relaxation there, and when they come away from those encounters, uh, they're bleeding with a, a thousand small cuts. So, so another 30 in the room, another 30% of men are saying, yeah, I've got a relationship with my dad, but it's difficult, it's, it's hostile. It goes on to say another 30% would have what they call a dutiful relationship with their dad. They basically go through the, the motions. They might visit their dad from time to time once a month, or they might phone them on a, on a basis. But the motivation for the contact is not some yearning or longing out of warmth. It's that D word. It's duty. Better give my dad a call. And so, although the regular contact has some degree of meaning, it's not really life-affirming for either party. So, so, so 90% of men in the room, and he's done this for decades, are basically saying, I don't have a great relationship with my dad. The remaining 10%, the, the lucky ones, say, I, I'm, I'm friends with my dad. My, my, my dad and I are, are friends, and there's this sense of emotional connection and support, and I admire them and enjoy being with them, and we'll, we'll, we'll be close to the day we die. Um, these at most, 10% uh, of men in the room. Uh, I found that pretty staggering. Uh, what would our world look like if 100% of people said, oh, I'm friends with my dad? But really, uh, only 10% of men on average are. And, and for those of you who are women here today, uh, I wonder what your relationship with your dad is like. And so, so that's, a, that's a sobering reality. And so maybe if you're friends with your dad today, you, you might be appreciating it just a little bit more than you did before hearing that. Or, or maybe if you're in one of those other categories, you're realizing you're not alone. You're not alone in your relationship with your dad. So, so, so what was your dad like? I wonder, well, we won't do a show of hands today, but I wonder what your relationship with your dad is, and, and what was your dad like, both men and women in the room today? Um, in a sense, our father is in us. Whether we realize it or not, uh, we all have some foundations in our life, and, and coming to understand who our father is or was is, is really important because as you probably discovered, we all have gestures, mannerisms, uh, ways of doing things that are exactly like our Father. No. Come on, don't look at me so spiritual. <laughs> and so until you come to know, understand, and accept, and maybe even love your Father, you, you will actually struggle to know and understand 
what you've inherited, what, what you've begun with. And, and so, what, what did you inherit? Uh, many things we didn't choose. We didn't choose our parents. <laughs> we didn't choose our nationality, our background, our culture, our personality, and many of our tendencies. We inherit them from our parents, but uh, of course, our dad. And so, it's really important to think about who your dad is and, and what's he What's he like? Um, funny story I might have told years ago. Um, if you ever met our family, we, we, we talk fast, uh, we walk fast, we eat fast. My dad used to say I was born in a hurry. <laughs> and uh, it's just kind of one of the characteristics of our family. Um, we don't know a lot about my dad's side. My mum was a Douglas um, and has really strong Irish and Scottish roots. And so uh, a number of years ago, we had a chance to go to Scotland. I never forget being in Edinburgh, and I went into a gift shop and I uh, was looking around and told the uh, the the uh, host or the salesperson there that uh, my mother just tell him I'm busy at the moment. <laughs> uh, t- told the, the the salesperson there that uh, my mother was a Douglas. So uh, of course, you know, all the clans in Scotland had all their paraphernalia, and so he's saying, "Oh, Douglas," and he's trying to sell me a Douglas kilt. I said, look, probably not going to wear that too much in Melbourne. Um, but but I, I did end up buying a Douglas scarf. Now, what I didn't realize at the time is that every clan has a motto. You know what the Douglas clan motto is? Always ahead, never behind. Always ahead, never behind. I, just think it's, it's in my jeans. <laughs> In fact, there's a little icon, a little coat of arms, and it has this little picture. And you know what the image is for the Douglas clan? It's a salamander in a forest fire. (laughs) Like, we're on the move, we're on the move. In fact, I recalled a little earlier when I was a younger leader having a kind of a mentoring day with Roland Croucher. We had a day, we went for a walk out in a park. At the end of the day, I said, you know, any reflections for me as a young leader? And he already said to me, he says, you know, when we walked around the park, you were in the middle of the path and a step ahead of me the whole way. <laughs> Always ahead, never behind. Now, I mentioned that humorously, but it's just an example of we've all inherited stuff. And so whatever your dad was like, the, the more you can understand know, accept uh, who your father was, it'll help you know what you've inherited and ultimately who you are. Uh, Who your father was matters. And so coming to terms with him and his life and why he was the way he was is really important. Uh, Ideally, we learn to love and respect our dad and our dad loves and respects us. But many times we don't always feel that and we've got some unfinished business with our dads. And so I just want to encourage you, if at all possible, to have a conversation with your father, a serious conversation about his childhood, his story, his work, uh, what he brought into the world and what was going on when he raised you. Find out the truth. Don't be judgmental, but but just understand the story. Um, Again, reading this book, Manhood, uh, Steve encourages us all, if we can, to have that kind of conversation with our father. And um, I was in my early 40s, I decided to do that with my dad. Again, I'd grown up in a relatively happy family, and as we'll talk about a little later, my dad tried to be to Sharon and I, my sister and I, the father he never had. And uh, he had no father, no mother, no, no parent, and, and tried to be what was missing in his life. Um, But as I look back on my childhood, um, if there was one kind of uh, difficult or hurtful thing between me and my dad is he he often missed important moments in my life. Often on my birthday, he'd be away preaching in a state somewhere, you know, or I'd have a basketball final uh, uh, and, oh, sorry, son, I'll I'll be away. And and so he quite often missed those moments. And mum was always there, but, but, but dad was busy doing something, and uh, yeah, it seems kind of minor, but the accumulation just, yeah, there, there was a bit, bit of pain there, but you kind of move on and you go on, and um, never forget my early 40s, uh, taking my dad out to lunch, you know, environment, timing, setting is really important, and in the lunch, I, I mean, you get pieces through the years, but I said, hey, dad, what, what was it like growing up without a dad or a mom? And uh, I just just let him talk, and he started telling me a bunch of stories, some I'd heard before, some I hadn't heard before. 
and uh, it, it was it was just a really meaningful lunch. Somewhere in the middle of the conversation, he just had a throwaway line, and he said this. He says, "You know, I don't think I ever had a birthday party till I married your mother." I, I said, "Sorry, sorry, what was that?" He says, "Yeah, I don't ever remember having a birthday party until I married your mother at age 25." I went, "What?" Here's a man who, as a kid, has no recollection of anyone ever celebrating his birthday until he's an adult. And, you know, it didn't change the fact that he'd missed so many of my birthdays, but I suddenly understood. Here's a man who had no memory of growing up with someone else celebrating those significant moments for him. And although it didn't change the past, it created some understanding for me of who my dad was and what it must have been like for him. And there was a degree of closeness and connection that developed just through those conversations. Then I, I started having a lunch with my dad once a month where we just go out and talk. And, and so I mentioned that today. Um, if your dad's still around, if he's still alive and you're able to do that, uh, understanding your father is, is really, really important. And so maybe just asking some questions and finding out a little bit more about him. Uh, maybe even forgiving him. Sometimes that's the most freeing thing that you can do. Um, if your father's not around, you, you, you could write a letter, even if he's not around. Maybe just putting those words, writing them out, or having an imaginary conversation. You know, just get a chair and, and just imagine Dad's there. What, what would you like to say to your dad? Or put a photo there. Um, there's something about just getting out and expressing those feelings and processing them. Let, let me also say, um, I think it's really important that we say thanks to our dads. Uh, none of them were perfect. <laughs> there's no perfect families. And it's easy to focus maybe on the negatives and what your dad wasn't and what he didn't do. But what, what could you thank your dad for? And I think Father's Day is a great day to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. We talk a lot about parents having power over their children in the way they treat them and particularly their feelings about themselves. You know, as we grow up, we actually hold the same power over our parents. And there are many dads who feel like they never got it right. There are many fathers who go to the grave convinced that they were inadequate as a father or a human being. And so we as adult children actually have the power to affirm and say thanks for those things that they did do for us. And so maybe this Father's Day is a chance for you to do that. What, what, what can you thank your dad for? And so your dad, what was he like? Who was he? What was your relationship with him? Of course, we can't change that. We can't control that. But we can then decide what we're going to do with that as we move forward forward. So that's your dad, and I know that's maybe a sensitive space for some of you in the room today, but, but think about your dad. Who was he? What was he like? What have, what have you inherited? And are there some things that maybe you can take a few steps towards today? Uh, second section, let's talk about us as dads, and uh, we prayed for the dads. Thank you, Jimmy, for your, your meaningful prayer today. Um, you know, you can become a dad in a moment. The art of parenting is, is a lifetime to learn. And uh, kids don't come with instructions. If you notice that, there's not even a user manual when they arrive, you know. Um, the art of parenting, and, and kids are different at every stage, every age of life. You never stop parenting. And so learning to father, learning to parent, uh, if you're a mother here today, is, is not an easy thing. But I need to say to all the dads, just what you know already, you're really important, dads. You're really important. Um, Malachi, uh, the prophet, said uh, God wants to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And so there's this need for this connection, not only with mothers, but this is Father's Day, so we'll be emphasizing the fathers. Um, back in the 1970s, last century, the Mattel Toy Company uh, wanted to market a new set of dolls called the Hart Family. And so they trialed the sets with children. And so there was a mother, a father, and two children in the Hart Family. The test children, in numerous samples, took the father doll and put him aside. <laughs> and then they played with the mother and the children. And when asked, what about the father doll? They said, oh, he's at work. <laughs> and they left the doll untouched in the corner. 
For all the children, back in 1970, father's work had no substance or meaning, and he was rarely used in the make-believe play. Eventually, of course, the problem was solved. The father dolls were sold separately with big muscles, armor, and a gun. (laughs) But, you know, the Industrial Revolution forever changed the nature of family and work, and men stopped being as near, as present to children as they had done in previous generations. And something called father hunger emerged as a hidden grief. And a lot has been written about this. Robert Bly talks about uh, if, if a dad only inhabits the house for an hour or two in the evening, then all he imparts is his mood, <laughs> which is usually irritation and fatigue. Um, David Blankenhorn, in his book, Fatherless America. And at that time, half of the children in America were living in a fatherless home. Um, did extensive research on the impact of fathers or the absence of fathers. And I won't go into all the details, but basically even a a half-decent dad around has a big positive impact on children. And so dads, you are important. But of course, uh, how how do we learn to father? How do we learn to parent? And um, let's just acknowledge today that families come in all shapes and sizes. That little nuclear family of mom and dad and two kids used to be the majority, it's now the minority of family configurations today. We've got married couples without children, we've got singles, whether separated, divorced, widowed, or never married, we've got single parents, we've got blended families. Did you know that the most common family configuration in Australia today is a blended family? One in three marriages end in divorce, and so the majority of of marriages today are actually a remarriage. So we've got step-parents, step-children, step-brothers, step-sisters, so blended families. And then we've got same-sex couples. We've got young adults living together, and let's not forget our seniors and grandparents. So there's lots of different configurations of family. Um, in fact, you can see this in the TV shows. Like when I was a kid, my dad's favorite show was Little House on the Prairie. Am I showing my age now? Classic family show. And, and then the Waltons. Anyone remember the Waltons? Good night, John Boy. The Waltons. Then we had the Brady Bunch, one of the first blended families, the Brady Bunch. Come on. And then Friends was a huge sitcom, a bunch of young adults living together. And then The Simpsons, moving on. (laughs) And then more recently, Modern Family. Uh, uh, Interesting to watch all the TV shows. And some people say culture follows TV. Other people say TV follows the culture. In fact, some sociologists say TV is about five years behind the actual culture. And so family configurations, families are changing. There's no perfect family. And although there's lots of joys, there's a lot of challenges. We've got the challenge of managing conflict, uh, communication breakdown, time pressures, nowadays often with both parents, working, financial pressures, sorry, I'm not trying to depress you, just defining reality here, mental health issues, including depression and anxiety, addictions, including substance abuse, gambling, pornography, and the impact of social media. Needless to say, <laughs> you know, we've got lots of challenges in our family world today, and for, for mums, for dads, for parents today, That's the world we live in. Uh, John Lee, I'm just watching my time, talks about defective fathers. The man who would be king, (laughs) who presumably worked hard all day, comes home to be waited uh, upon by his loyal spouse and seen but not heard children. Be careful not to bother him. This is the wait till your father gets home, dad. The man who would be king. Another defective father, the critical father, full of put-downs and nitpicking. Uh, out of his own frustration and anger. Then there's the passive father who gives up all the duties and responsibilities and power to his partner, and he's never really there. When he gets home, he retreats to the TV, newspaper, garden shed, or can of beer. Then there's the absent father, off having a career, leaving early, returning late at night, misses all the special events. He's never really there. We know all about the kinds of fathers we don't want to be. And so well, what are some characteristics of good dads? And again, um, other parents can take this on. But for you dads today, a good father, Gary Chapman says, is active in his fathering. Uh, you know, love is more about what you do than just a feeling or what you say. It's what you do. A good father is active in their parenting, initiating connection with uh, their children. Secondly, a good father makes time 
to be with his children, doing things together. For kids, love is often spelt T-I-M-E, time. And uh, busyness is one of the enemies uh, in our parenting re- relationships today. And sometimes our job can actually be a danger to uh, our relationship with our kids. Uh, the truth is they won't always be around. Um, when our kids were really little, I remember being in the foyer of our church at that time, and the oldies would come up and go, oh, enjoy them while they're young, they grow quickly. And you laugh, they were right. They were right. You know, our kids are all in their 30s now, and you just kind of go, my goodness, where did the time go? i never forget a, a story by Tony Compolo. You might have heard it. Let me read it to you. There was once a little boy named Mike. When he was a toddler, he wanted a sand pit. His mother said, that'll be good. His father said, there goes the backyard. There'll be sand all over the place, and it'll kill the grass. The little boy's mother smiled and said, the grass will grow back. When Mike was five, he wanted a jungle gym that would enable him to climb into the sky and swings that would take his breath away. His dad said, if we put that thing in the backyard, every kid in the neighborhood will be over here. They'll run back and forth, back and forth, and they'll kill the grass. Mike's mother smiled and said, the grass will grow back. Between breaths, as he was blowing up the plastic swimming pool, Mike's dad said, you know what? They're going to condemn this place and make it a missile site. You won't be able to take out the rubbish without coming back with mud all over your neck. It's going to kill the grass. Mike's mother said, the grass will grow back. When Mike was 12, he volunteered his yard for a camp out. When the neighborhood boys drilled the spikes into the ground and stomped around with their big feet, Mike's dad looked out the window and said, why don't I save myself the trouble and put the grass in cereal bowls? I know, the grass will grow back. (laughs) The basketball hoop on the side of the garage drew a bigger crowd than the Summer Olympics. The barren spot under the hoop got larger and larger until it encompassed the encompassed the whole side yard. And just when it looked as though a new grass was going to take root, winter came, rain fell, and muddy boots beat the grass into the ground. Mike's father said, Lord, I never asked for much in this life, just a few crummy blades of grass. (laughs) Mike's mother smiled and said, the grass will grow back. Well, this year, This year, the grass was beautiful. Sorry. It rolled out like a carpet, like a green sponge along the driveway, where bicycles once fell. Out. Out along the flower beds where little boys once dug with teaspoons. Thanks, Kay. But Mike's dad never saw the grass. Instead, his eyes were lifted beyond the yard. He said with a catch in his voice, he will come back. He will come back. He will come back, won't he? You know, sometimes we're focused on the grass and not the kids. Don't know what the grass is for you, but sometimes we just get our priorities a little bit messed up. I always find stuff like that a bit emotional. (laughs) They grow so quickly. Anyone seen that, heard that Abba song, Slipping Through My Fingers? Mother and a daughter. Just a reminder that uh, they, they grow quickly and time often is the, the best gift we can give our children. Good fathers engage with conversation. They play with their children. They teach values. They provide and protect. They love their children. And so dads, uh, you, you can't go back and make a fresh start, but today you can make a a fresh beginning, and what, what kind of dad can you be for your kids going forward? Uh, for the mums in the room, you know, uh, d- don't do it alone. Be, be in community. Ha- have a wider network. Ask for help. For, find mentors, and that's where church is so good, and school, and, and uh, we, we, we need one another to help uh, parent our children. So, a few thoughts about your dad, uh, a few thoughts for the dads in the room. You, you really are important. And none of us are perfect. We don't always get it right. But uh, what, what would your kids need from you today, this year, right now? Um, be, be that for them. Finally, let's, let's talk about God as loving parent. This year, I've been doing a series called Experiences of the Divine. And I wonder whether a, a parent's love for their children is actually a, a reflection of 
God's love for us as his kids, as we've, we've heard already. Uh, I've told you before, when I first became a child, a little boy, Josiah, a little redhead in my arms, he's 35 now, um, uh, I remember holding him and just being overwhelmed with my love for him as a father. And I've shared before just the processing I went through in that moment of why do I love him so much? Like he hasn't kicked a goal yet. You know, <laughs> he hasn't scored an A on a test. Um, he hasn't made any money. In fact, it costs us a lot of money just to get him <laughs> right here. You know, And I'm, I'm holding him thinking, why do I love him so much? He's done nothing. But he is more valuable than anything else in my life. And I think for the first time, God as father, as dad, as parent, kind of slipped from my head to my heart to realize maybe that's how God feels about me. And his love for me is not based on how many goals I've kicked and how many A's I've scored and how much money I'm making. Maybe it's just based on the fact that I'm his child. And so I wonder whether this Father's Day, that's something for you to experience for the first time or to be reminded of. What do you think about when you think of God? There are many different images and pictures of God. And as Pastor Rob has been sharing so powerfully the last few weeks, when we look at the Bible, we need to make sure we use Jesus as the filter for everything. And it's incredible when Jesus talks about God, the number one picture he uses is God as Father. And not just a dad, a father, but a loving, caring parent. Uh, again, as, as Kay shared so beautifully over um, our, our time of offering today, uh, the greatest revelation of God in the Bible is as Father. In, in fact, right at Jesus' baptism, <laughs> we got that a story of the Father bursting out of heaven saying, that's my boy. I'm really pleased with him. <laughs> Again, Jesus hasn't preached a sermon yet. He hasn't healed anybody. He's done nothing, and yet the Father's gone, I'm so pleased. That's my boy. And, and then Jesus himself uh, would call the father Abba, which means daddy. It's a close and intimate relationship of father and child. And Jesus said, I came to reveal the father, God as father, to you. I love this here, John, the follower of Jesus. Let's pick this up on the next slide there. See what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The Message Bible says, what marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God. That's who we really are. If you go through the New Testament, this image of God as Father. Paul, every prayer, grace and peace from God the Father. Uh, we are his children. We can call out Abba, Daddy, Father. So not only did Jesus have this intimate relationship with God as loving parent, uh, you and I are also invited in to know God and experience God as loving parents. So, so very important. Now, now again, as I've said before, that doesn't mean God is male. <laughs> um, the image of God is not male or male over female. In fact, the image of God is male and female, and it takes men and women to reflect the nature of God. And the Bible actually has many feminine images of God. Isaiah says, uh, you get God angry, it's like a mother bear uh, protecting its cubs. You don't want to mess with a mother bear. Uh, Jesus said, like a mother hen gathers its chicks under its wings, so I wanted to gather you, Jerusalem. Paul says, a leadership metaphor, like a nursing mother caring for her children. So there are many feminine images of God and that's a whole subject, the divine feminine. And so we're not saying God as father means that God is male, but it is a picture uh, of God as perfect loving parent to us. And so whatever your natural dad was like or wasn't like, uh, God wants to be that perfect heavenly father to each one of us. And we get to be part of a new family. You know, the most common term for followers of Jesus in the New Testament is brothers and sisters in Christ. Brothers and sisters, we have a, a, a heavenly parent, a heavenly father, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And the number one quality of God as father is love. Let's look at uh, Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, coming up now. Watch what God does, then you do it. Like children, this is the Message Bible, who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. 
Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love us in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. That's just so powerful. God as loving parent, wanting the very best for you and I. And so in our last few minutes, what do we have as children of God? Reminder coming up, and this is a great example for us as parents. We have love and acceptance from God our Father. And it's not based on our performance or how well we're doing. You know, if you said to me, what do I think of my kids today? I'd say, if you lined up all the kids in the world, I'd say, my kids are the best of everybody. If you said, have they ever done anything wrong? I'd say, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> I don't love them because they've always done what I wanted them to do. I love them because they're mine. And so God's love for us, uh, Paul puts it this way, Romans 5.8, the proof of God's amazing love is this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together before he chose to love us. And so we have love and acceptance. Secondly, we have identity and belonging. It's in who we are and whose we are, not necessarily what we do or achieve. And so we're part of a, a bigger family of brothers and sisters in Christ. Thirdly, we have security. Nothing can separate us from God's love. He sees, he knows, he cares what's happening in your life today. Fourthly, uh, we have provision. He watches over us. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds. <laughs> they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you much more valuable to him than they are. And then number five, purpose, a sense of purpose for life, uh, to, to contribute to God's work in the world. And, and so God wants to be our father and uh, for us to experience that parental love for us as his children. I want to finish with a, a prayer for us today and then pray together. Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father the creator of everything in heaven and earth, Paul says. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he would empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to fully understand, then you may be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Just say these words with me, if you will. I have a Father who loves me. One more time. I have a Father who loves me. Say these three words. I am loved. One more time. I am am love. Then say these words, Father, I receive your love. Father, I receive your love. One more time. Father, I receive your love. Let's pray. Father, today we, on this Father's Day, just pause for a moment and think about our own dads. And we all have something to be thankful for. And I pray that maybe on this Father's Day, there could be some reconnecting of the hearts of children to dads. Maybe there's a conversation to have this week, maybe a letter to write, maybe some forgiveness to flow, maybe some thanks to be given uh, for those that um, this is a painful time, an absent, an abusive, uh, or, or, no, or no dad. I pray for your, your grace and your healing to flow into those hearts today. For those of us who are dads and Maybe mum's here today. Lord, I think true success is having those closest to us love and respect us the most. And although family relationships aren't everything, they are vitally important. And so help us today to be the, the kind of dads, the kind of parents that our kids need at this stage in their life, to, to be there for them, to support, to encourage, to lovingly confront as appropriate, to to give them time just to be present, to be available, to be attentive. Help us to be the, the kind of dads, the kind of parents that will add value to our children. And finally, God, thank you that of all the images that people have painted of you, Jesus came to show us that you are a father, a, a loving father, not just our creator 
but our loving Father. And for those today that know that, may that be a, a fresh revelation today, not something we take for granted. For those that are in the room watching online today that maybe have never experienced that love of God as Father, Father, I pray as they open their hearts even now, you would fill them with that sense of love, that they would see your smile today, that they would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You are my son, you are my daughter with whom I am well pleased. I pray that today, and I pray for your incredible spirit to be at work in all of our lives, all of our families on this Father's Day. We'll be sure to give you all the glory, all the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Happy Father's Day. God bless you.